start the recording so that we can have a recording of this since um, it's not going to go out as a Facebook Live today. It wants to put it out on my personal page, which won't help us at all. <laughs> oh. I'm Siobhan Kidd, and I'm your host today. I'm the outreach manager at uh, OVARP, who I see your friend. <laughs> I'm the outreach manager at the Snow Leopard Conservancy, and please um, forgive my laryngitis today. Um, I was the uh, author, editor for Searching for the Snow Leopard with Bjorn Pearson, uh, the wildlife photographer. And our special guest for today is Susan Liebig. She is from Vancouver, uh, Canada. And I'm going to let Susan um, introduce uh, herself to you. She was one of the contributors from to um, Searching for the Snow Leopard. And I'm going to share her drawing that appears um, in let's see here. Here we go. Hopefully everyone can see. Um, this is the drawing that Susan did, and it appears in the introduction section of the book. Um, so beautiful, Susan, just beautiful. Thank you. So I'm going to take that down. And if you'd like to take it away, Susan, and introduce yourself and Tell us a little bit about your writings and, and your artistry and uh, okay. how well, you came to know the Snow Leopard Conservancy. <laughs> how I got to know it? Yeah, how yeah. you came in here. Okay, it. yeah, I'm, I'm Susan and uh, I'm living in uh, Vancouver, BC. And uh, yeah, I am doing art most of my life and uh, kind of a little bit of writing here and there. But um, yeah, I've always been interested in, in wildlife and the natural world. Um, and it has only gotten stronger as I get older. So that remains kind of a, a big huge part of my life. And um, as to snow leopards, uh, I think from the very first I heard of this creature, I was like hooked, um, partly because their beauty, of course, and also the environments that they live in. Um, there are these incredibly beautiful wildcats that live in uh, high altitude mountains, um, mostly in, in the Himalaya and, and also in Kyrgyzstan and uh, Tibet. And um, well, you can see maps of their range on the Snow Leopard Conservancy site. Um, yeah, they're just an astonishing creature. Uh, their adaptations. Um, and also I think what drew me to actually make some pilgrimages over there to areas that they live was also the, the human cultures that they live in. And the Snow Leopard Conservancy, of course, um, with all their work has been very attentive and has always worked with local communities um, in their conservation efforts, uh, because that is truly key to, uh, helping conserve this animal. Um, there have historically been a lot of conflicts with uh, villagers and um, pastoral people who have herding animals. And of course the snow leopard will prey on goats and sheep and uh, donkeys, domestic, domestic stock, yaks. So um, working with the communities is sort of been a turnaround. And that was also one of the reasons I was drawn to uh, go to Ladakh, India in 2008 uh, in support of the Snow Leopard Conservancy and the Snow Leopard Conservancy of India. Um, they started arranging homestay projects where you could go and do a combination of, of camping in Hemis National Park and, uh, and staying in traditional Ladakhi homes. So that was what got me over there in 2008. And I had traveled, uh, in the Himalaya back when I was much younger, when I was in my 20s and became really passionate about uh, that part of the world and uh, 
again, some of the, both the human and the wild aspects of life in the Himalaya. So in uh, 2008, I went over there in the winter, which is the best time to see these animals. And uh, it was very cold and uh, <laughs> freezing. Uh, and it also lent a kind of a beautiful aura to the whole trip um, in that everything was frozen, the rivers were frozen. So you didn't have the ambient sounds of, of the water courses and the streams. Everything was really, really silent. Um, and it was the first time I think I ever experienced something that might be called a ringing silence because it was so silent that it had its own sound, if you know what I mean. Um, so it was this beautiful area. And I was extremely fortunate. I was in a very small group of people. I think there were about five of us. And uh, we had guides that were provided by the Snow Leopard Conservancy of India. Everybody was so skilled and so lovely. And um, a lot of the people there, they have contacts with, uh, with locals and villagers. And that was key to our seeing uh, the snow leopards that we saw. Uh, let me think. We saw a snow leopard on the first, the very first day we had hiked in to a certain point and the altitude was already pretty daunting if you haven't been at altitude. And how so, long, Susan, were you, um, how long did it take you to acclimatize to get you uh, to the altitude? Yeah, it, it takes, uh, it takes at least a week or so. And I was in Leh, Ladakh for a little bit before, um, but still, when you lays at about twelve thousand feet, um, can't remember the meters, but uh, and we were going up to about fourteen thousand feet um, to the village of Rumbok and Yurtse, and now I believe that there's actually a road uh, into Rumbok, which is a tiny village that calls itself uh, the Snow Leopard Capital of the World. Um, it's a beautiful place. Actually, I have a picture right here. <laughs> This is, uh, uh, this is the reflections, but that's taken in rum back. And um, yeah, so the first day out, um, we were hailed and called by uh, a villager saying, hey, there's a snow leopard just up the frozen creek, just across the way. It's about, you know, half a mile from here. And it just caught a blue sheep. So that was the perfect. Wow. The perfect time to really observe a wild snow leopard is when they're on a kill because they're not gonna, you won't see them fleetingly. They'll be there, they'll be eating, sitting, resting, um, fending off other creatures that come to get a little nibble on things. So it was fantastic. And uh, if, if you want, uh, Siobhan, maybe I should read my little passage here at this point. Um, That'd be when, great. Sure. When I first, uh, this is from the book that we're celebrating here. Searching for the Snow Leopard. Um, it's a marvelous book that's put together, mostly spearheaded the efforts of Siobhan here. So thank you again, Siobhan. And has uh, contributions by amazing photographers of which I'm not, <laughs> and uh, wildlife researchers who do invaluable work um, helping to conserve uh, this creature and, and other animals in that realm. So anyway, I have a little bit of uh, writing here in this book, which was, just some impressions when I first stepped up to uh, see this wild snow leopard uh, in the winter of 2008. So here it is. Uh, some 80 feet away on a flat throne of rock, the snow leopard sat. Stepping up to the scope, I peered through as if to another dimension. That face, the hidden spirit of the mountains themselves revealed. The snow leopard was sitting atop her kill, the carcass of a blue sheep. The long fur of her pelt gleamed and changed in the light. It was spotted with dark rosettes along her flank and down her extraordinarily long tail, and long and lush tail. The tawny buff gold of her coat was luminous, seeming to generate its own rare light. Her face, all the sensory graces of her converging there, the soft tufts of fur on her inner ears, the unique patterns of spots and ink dark calligraphed curves of marks above her eyes, the broad nose, whiskered muzzle, dark lipped mouth. Her huge forepaws were resting in front of her, 
instruments of agility and athleticism. They grip rocks, float through deep snow, lead her leaps in pursuit of prey. Her eyes were green amber, like some rare and unusual gem. Looking through the scope, she seemed to be staring straight back, full on. Her gaze overturned me. I could not take my eyes away from her mesmerizing presence. We all watched, transfixed as she rose. The long fur of her pelt gleamed and changed in the light. Suddenly she was in motion, moving up the rocks in a supple fluid flow. This lightness of form came from honed strength, a synchronous arc and tension of muscle and mind. Reading the terrain by sight and feel, she was in perfect duet with the earth itself. So yeah, that was a wow. remarkable moment and uh, certainly I'll never forget it. And, uh, and the beauty was, uh, uh, it was it was kind of getting near dusk, but the light was still there. It was extremely cold, but we were all so transfixed. We stayed there and watched her atop this kill and she would primarily feed. And sometimes she'd get up and stretch. And as we saw, she kind of uh, would leap up to some boulders above and just hang out, then go back down to her prey. A little fox came along, magpies would, um, come and try and get little snippets of her prey and she would snarl at them. So we had a very companionable and long couple of hours until it grew so dark that we had to leave. It was cold and- um, Yeah, how the, close were you to her? What was the distance? Yeah, there? we were about 80 feet away and it was uh, across a frozen river and she wasn't that high. She was up on, we were on one side of the frozen river and she was on the other and she was up on some boulders, some rocks above us, just slightly above. So we had a, a wonderful view. We had, of course, spotting scopes. So we could go in extremely close um, in seeing her. And uh, the next day we, we came back up to the site and she was gone. There was very little left of the, of the, of the blue sheep. But then we saw a little retinue of um, other animals that come and, and fed on the scraps, which is also another key thing because the snow leopards are the apex predator of these areas and um, everything they do affects all the other animals and they provide in a certain sense um, when they have a kill that animals who come and scavenge, um, it also provides for them like the, the red foxes we saw and um, there's also little um, littler animals like uh, weasels and um, the birds come. There are uh, golden eagles in that area. I think there's lammergeiers. Uh, there's magpies that were always around. And the birds are always a, a key to when you're searching for snow leopards. If you hear birds or see birds um, making a racket or the, the magpies are, are sounding off, um, Often that's a sign that there's a leopard around and the snow leopard may be on a kill. So that was the first wild snow leopard I ever saw. Uh, I was so lucky. And, wow. uh, and then the, in the next couple of days, we moved up the valleys and explored around and it was just all beautiful. Whether or not we saw another snow leopard, I was extremely happy. But a couple of days later, we actually saw another one. This time it was, uh, uh, and another a snow leopard on a kill. Um, and this time it had killed a domestic goat. Um, the herder who owned the goat had, had told us about it. And we went up near this village called Yurtse. And um, again, this time we had about seven hours. It was during the day and the cat had, was quite sated and was just hanging out, really napping the whole time. So we sat <laughs> across and uh, with our binoculars and scopes, we just watched it. Um, finally, in the end of the day, it woke up and stretched and uh, everything was wonderful to see. Um, so that was great. I, I can show a few very blurry pictures. I'm not a great photographer and I had a small digital camera at the time, but I'll show you some images that, uh, that were taken through the scope. They're blurry, they're not National Geographic, but this is uh, the face of the first snow leopard. Wow. And uh, very content. And then this is another shot. I have another, a few more, but uh, anyway, just grab these. Um, yeah, it's, 
it's an amazing experience to be in the presence of this animal. Um, I think even researchers, and even researchers don't often see them, but people who are in the field a lot, like uh, uh, like Jigme Dog, 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 who lives in Ley, um, he's seen many, maybe more than most people, but I think he too is astonished every time he sees one, or Rodney Jackson. Um, the head of the Snow Leopard Conservancy. Um, yeah, he's joined us, uh, Susan. Oh, okay. Hey. Yeah, um, I'm going to see yeah. if we can un unmute his um, microphone. And, and Darla has joined us too. Okay, great. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Rodney Jackson and Darla Hillard, who really have been so dedicated in all their endeavors uh, towards conservation of snow leopards. And, and one of my inspirations for making the effort to go and see if I could see one was their wonderful well, Darla's book, um, <laughs> which is Vanishing Tracks, which is about their time in um, Western Nepal. And they were really the pioneers of, of uh, out being out in the field and studying snow leopards. It's uh, four years among the snow leopards of Nepal. Um, fantastic book. That was one of my inspirations. So um, I really recommend to anyone who wants to read more, this is a classic book. Yeah, that's a wonderful book. My copy is just right behind me. I've, okay. I've read it two or three times now. I, I do enjoy exactly. it. Yeah. So, Darla uh, and Rodney, would you like to say hi? I, I, we've unmuted them, I think. And here, oh, Darla, I think you get the credit first with Vanishing Tracks and capturing our long first associations with small leopards. Yeah. Are you online? Yeah. Yes, um, what I'll do is I'll put a 100% off coupon so anybody who would like to read the book can read it. There's only an e version available at the moment. Okay. So unless you go on Amazon and get it um, at first edition used, um, yes. if you would like to read the ebook, you're welcome to. I'll do it right after we. Um, right after this talk is finished. It's smashwords.com and just search for Vanishing Tracks. I think you have to put my name in too, Darla Hillard. Otherwise there will be some other Vanishing Tracks, but you can find it and um, make sure you use the coupon. And then if you like it and you would like to make a donation, then please feel free. That's Thanks. really neat. Yeah, I, um, I, we were the lucky ones, I guess, Susan, that we got our copy. Yeah, if you go- I got mine secondhand from the Murray Library. So uh, th there are secondhand copies out there if you want the, the book version. Um, yeah, it's, it's really worth reading. Um, it's a wonderful book. I'm going to um, put the link in uh, to the chat here for everyone to see. Get Vanishing Track, so um, I link there. And also, if you go to our website and you go to our online store, uh, you can get to it that way also. But I did just now put the link to Vanishing Tracks in the chat on yeah. Zoom. So, and, and in used bookstores around the country, I've seen some of the older editions. They are available. Uh, if you happen to go to Kathmandu, there are a bunch there. Um, obviously, you're not going to go in the next few weeks, but whenever you do go, that, that's the place to go, and you'll find the book. So, um, Susan, thank you so much for all your wonderful drawings and your support for Snow Leopards. We really appreciate it. And your story is just so, you know, it's so classic. Um, these cats uh, can hide from you if they want to hide from you. You'll never see them. But yeah. when they want to show themselves, they literally yards away from you and they, they'll sit and stare at you. It's and so I think your, your view of looking across the stream, I, I assume this was in Rumbok, but I'm not sure um, that you saw the cat across the stream, the frozen stream. And I think that cat, you know, I think they can read people's faces and people's body language and they can tell who is a threatening individual and who is not. And if they're not threatening, they're going to be with you. They'll watch you until they decide it's time over and then they'll leave. That's so 
scene two in, in a short 10 day trip or however long you were there is yeah. really quite an unusual record. That's fantastic. It, it was indeed. Uh, I know Cheetah, our, our lead guide, uh, he kept saying, oh, good karma group. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, well, how could we be so lucky? But uh, yeah, you know, Rodney, what you just said about the demeanor of the cat, um, both times that in Ladakh, seeing these cats, they, they weren't threatened at all. And in some ways they just acted like a, a huge, beautiful house cat. Um, which was just so wonderful to see. Um, at the same time, you know, they're, they're mystical, they're ethereal, and, um, but, they're, but they're very real. I mean, to go and see the, the remains of a kill, you know that this is also a very er earthy creature, um, a wild animal. And um, yeah, there, there's so many aspects to them uh, and how we perceive them and how they're culturally perceived. Um, they, there's just, they're just fascinating, there's no doubt. But uh, yeah, I feel really lucky. Um, the second time, I, in 2019, I, I traveled um, to part of China, well, actually, well, Tibet, autonomous Tibet, um, in the Qinghai province. And uh, I'll just hold up a quick image here. This is taken by my friend Linus, but uh, we saw also a snow leopard there. Um, wow. And uh, again, seeing a wild snow leopard, this was a very close vantage point that um, we climbed up a kind of a, a ridge and we're looking down and uh, the cat literally was below me. I just looked down, I only saw it for a very brief time this time, but it was crossing <clears throat> some boulders and it, it glanced up at me and then it literally vanished. Um, and again, it's a, a very moving experience to see these animals um, because they are so uh, hard to find, hard to see. And um, they can watch you and see you and you'll never know that they're there. Their, their ability to camouflage themselves is extraordinary. <clears throat> and it's all built into their practices of hunting and, and being a predator. Um, they have to make sure they're the blue sheep don't know that they're there and uh, so they know how to hide very well yeah and they also like to be above you so that's probably why it vanished very quickly it was below you it was below me it didn't it didn't like that <laughs> yeah yeah but i remember <laughs> back in the 80s when you know we had collars on them we would know from their signal roughly where to look for them but we very rarely saw them because of that camouflage in fact we would spend nine, up to nine months a year out in the field every day. We had cats all around us and we only saw them maybe four times a year other than when we were attaching the radio collars. Yes. And often I walked, oh, say three, four yards from one and I didn't see it. And I just heard a rock fall and I turned around and I see a tail disappearing. <laughs> Yeah, we have a, we have a question, Susan, in the chat, which kind of leads into um, back to searching for the snow leopard. It reads, I've heard from many people that seeing a wild snow leopard can almost be like a spiritual experience. Was it so was it so to you? And that's really what the book Searching for the Snow Leopard is about. It's more of an anthropological book, more about our relationship, our bond with snow leopards than a biological book, um, even though there is a lot of science in it, natural history and a lot of conservation. But I wanted to read you some passages and then, and then see what you thought, Susan, you know, if you had similar experiences. Okay. Shrouded in the swirling snow, she magically appears, climbing effortlessly across the high ridge. Her presence is felt even when not seen. The humans who have gone in search of her know they are not alone. She is there watching, guarding, unseen in her frozen realm of rock and snow. And then from another page, for those who go in search of the snow leopard, the expedition may hold unexpected discoveries. Though their goal is to observe and photograph one of the most elusive predators on the planet, 
they may also witness a magical transformation of the stark frigid landscape to one of true beauty and experience the interconnectedness of nature and the human spirit. And Bjorn Pearson wrote, upon taking my first step into the Hemis National Park in India, I knew I was faced with a challenge like I had never experienced before. This world of inhospitable ice and rocks had no welcoming signs. The mountains greeted me with a snowstorm so severe I could hardly see more than a foot in front of me. The first few days were unbearable and the sharp slippery rocks were my worst enemy. Most frustrating of all, there was not one sign of a snow leopard. The long hours of waiting in the chilling wind wore away at me, but just as I was on the brink of giving up, something began to happen. I let go of my expectations. Instead of frantically looking for this iconic predator, I started to discover the beauty around me. I saw the sun reflecting in the snow, resembling a sea of diamonds. I began to appreciate the fresh northern wind against my face. And I realized that what I first thought was a freezing cold lifeless hell was in truth a paradise. I felt a peace began to grow within myself. My determination and selfish eagerness were replaced with an overwhelming feeling of gratitude for just being there. I turned my thoughts inward. The long days of waiting gave me the opportunity to contemplate who I was and what really mattered in life. I believe I was discovering my soul. Ultimately, I didn't think about the snow leopard at all. That big day was the first time I saw one. Encountering this material feline is not only about thorough preparation, hard work, and fighting the elements, it's about erasing all your apprehension. It's not about desperately searching for it, it's about opening your soul and seeing with your heart. Only then will you be successful in finding a snow leopard. Was it like that for you? Was it a transformative experience? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um... It, it, it is. Um, I found it very powerful and, and very moving. And um, it, it does call up all those things. I mean, there's also that, you know, that fierce anticipa anticipation when you really desire for something to happen and you, you don't know if it will. Right. So, um, and there's something I think in any kind of encounter with a wild animal that uh, for me has always been um, so vivid and so important, so transformative, because it's kind of an encounter that's wordless. We don't really have language for where we go in those moments, um, but we're in contact with another consciousness, another being that um, has a its own vitality, its own aura. And in the case of the snow leopard, um, it is that, whole interdependence of uh, where it is in those mountains, all the right. other creatures, um, the human lives around it. Um, you're all, it's all part of it all. Uh, so yeah, definitely. Um, but snow leopards themselves, there is such a mystique and um, it's very real. It's not something that people have to uh, embellish or rhapsodize about. It's just very real. They're very, there's something very, unusual about them. I couldn't even name it. Um, yeah. Well, your Pardon. drawing in the passage that you read that appears in the book, they move me so much. I, I get goosebumps and tears in my eyes when you read that passage. It's it, like you said, you don't have to embellish it. It's real. It's, it's there. It's, um, there's just something about them that as I read over the years, it's, it's like they, no one can really put their finger on it but it's a real thing. It's, there's a, there's a feeling and, and all cats, I think, inspire that, you know, the tigers and the lions and the forest leopards, but none like the snow leopard. And, and maybe it's what you say, like it's where they are plays. I loved the way you described that the silence almost had a ringing to it. That is so, I, I can, I can hear that in my mind when you said that. Do you yeah. think it, it is a combination of where they are, of that part of our, our planet and 
the cat itself. Yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and kind of the mystery of an animal that is um, so hard to see. Uh, most of its <clears throat> life goes on without humans observing it. And so, you know, I think if you have a moment of being able to witness its presence, it's, it's, it, it's, it's very wonderful. Um, yeah, I've, I returned to Ladakh in the summer and I've also traveled in, uh, in Dolpo and in Western Nepal um, several times. And that's prime snow leopard country as well. Um, where I went in, in Ladakh in the summer, we, we constantly saw signs of snow leopard, but never saw one. We're literally walking along rivers where we're following their tracks that are very fresh, never seeing them. But even just being in their in their terrain is enlivening. Um, you're aware of them. Uh, you wonder if they're watching you. And similarly in in Dolpo, um, I've seen many snow leopard tracks there and uh, talk to people. Um, I've seen them. Ah, nice shot. Where is this? That is. Um... Uh, that's Bjorn Pearson's photo, and that is India. Um, yeah, oh, I see the, the snow on the ridge. And there's the snow leopard right on the the edge. And this photo does appear in the book. Um, it's a beautiful thing. It's just it seems to capture the whole what you're describing. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, a priceless shot. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I begged him. I said, "Oh, please, uh, we have to have that one." <laughs> yeah, I I have a uh, something I'd like to share in reading. I I did write an essay on on all about snow leopards, and this is a part from that. Um, also referencing uh, Rin Chin Wangchuk, who died, um, I think, quite a decade ago or so. Um, but he was formative in putting together the Snow Leopard Conservancy in India. But um, Rinchen wrote something I really liked and it kind of goes with that photo you just showed. Um, Rinchen Wangchuk <clears throat> has a fine description of a snow leopard's grace from field notes of a sighting in Zanskar, which is a remote part of Ladakh. This is his piece. The sun had gone down, the visibility was still good, especially over the skyline. After a minute of scanning, I could see the smoke-like snow leopard peering over the ridge. Then I could recognize the cat's back as it moved gently, hugging to the rocks. It was as though a little strip of cloud was moving over the ridge. So there's that sense too that they shapeshift with the elements that they're a part of. Um, they can be cloud-like, they can be rock-like, they can blend in with lichen. Um, and that ethereality is a, a really interesting part of this creature as well. And I think when I made the drawing, the illustration um, that's in the book, I think I, it wasn't so much like the exact sort of replica of a snow leopard. It was more the feel that I wanted to generate of this kind of um, shape-shifting, uh, ethereal um, creature and, and how it moves and can appear and disappear, it seems, at will. So, yeah. Yeah, we have a whole uh, chapter, if you don't have a copy of the book, but there's a whole chapter in the book called The Spirit Animal. And uh, that was our publisher's request that we include an entire chapter about the legends, the folklore, and the spirituality of the snow leopard and about the bond that between humans and the snow leopard. Um, I can read a little bit from it. Um, and then you said you had some other things to read, Susan, uh, another essay to read. Uh, I, I could, I'll see what you come up with. And okay. if it fits in, I'll throw it in otherwise. Legends, symbols, and spiritual beliefs, and I'm sorry about my laryngitis, abound demonstrating the bond people have had for centuries with the spotted cat of the Asian mountains. Ancient petroglyphs found in Kyrgyzstan depict what are thought to be snow leopards hunting with humans. However, Kyrgyz indigenous cultural practitioner, and Darla probably could say his name better than I can, uh, Jarpakul Rambakov, believes that to be a cursory interpretation. 
He sees the rock drawing, which traces a line between a snow leopard and a man holding a bow as a metaphorical representation of the need for people to learn from the wisdom of the snow leopard. And by doing so, to overcome the destructive nature of the human species in order to bring about harmony and balance with the natural world. In either interpretation, this petroglyph represents the deep connection people along, have long had with the snow leopard. Throughout history, the snow leopard has been regarded as a spiritual being. Since ancient times, it has been thought of as a totem animal or spirit guide and worshiped as the Lord of the celestial mountains. As a source of spiritual power, it represents a link between the spirit and the natural world. In some ancient traditions, the snow leopard was seen as an animal that purified the human environment and therefore it was forbidden to hunt, kill, or violate it in any way. Today's indigenous cultural practitioners calling on those ancient beliefs look for ways to protect the snow leopard species from persecution while at the same time seeking to revive the cultural heritage of the communities they represent. Through their efforts, whether speaking one-on-one -on -one with individuals of the community or officiating at ceremonial gatherings, they remind the local people that the snow leopard is a sacred animal and the protector of sacred mountains. Culturally, there is an abundance of evidence throughout the region that the snow leopard remains in high regard today. Its likeness is represented on coins, currency and postage, stamps, sculptures of the great cat can be found throughout the 12 range countries. There is even a bronze sculpture of the snow leopard in Gorky Park in Moscow. Hockey teams in Kazakhstan have taken names related to the snow leopard and the mascot for the 2011 Asian Olympic games was a snow leopard cub named Irby. The cultural importance of this mysterious cat is also evidenced by the superstitions that revolve around it. A reincurrent theme of local legends is that if a person does harm to a snow leopard, harm will come to them and their entire family. Variations of this legend have been told again and again in many different languages by people from most, if not all of the range countries. They are perpetuated by multiple reports of actual illnesses, accidents and injuries of some or all members of a family responsible for killing a snow leopard in retaliation for livestock losses. Even coincidental deaths have been reported. Such occurrences only serve to reinforce the superstitious notion associated with the snow leopard. And that chapter goes on to talk about specific, um, you know, instances of, uh, you know, shape shifting and um, animals as protector spirits that follow a person throughout their life. It's, there's many, many stories, and they, there are just a few in searching. But is that, <clears throat> excuse me, Susan, is that what you, um, you know, experience, did, did the local people share with you their legends or uh, beliefs about the snow leopard when you were there? Um, I, heard, I heard different things. Um, what I really felt most strongly was how, um, the villagers who had to cope with the reality of this predator in their midst, um, once that the Snow Leopard Conservancy had helped Corral prove their animals and made life a lot, a lot better, um, how appreciative they were um, and how they were really quite, quite delighted to have snow leopards in their midst. And um, in the homestay they did in Rumbach, um, the local folks were really excited about seeing um, the photographs that the people in my little group had and um, looking at videos and just hanging out with them. Um, they'd really felt um, that the snow leopard, uh, I think it's one of the local hunters, herders was quoted as saying that they're like the, uh, the jewel in the garland of our mountains. and. Um, they're very well regarded um, when there is that kind of ability to coexist. Um, and, and certainly in, in legends, yeah, they're there. They're shapeshifters for sure. And uh, I remember meeting an old woman in the village of uh, this, uh, Yul Yulchen, I'm not sure if that's the right name, but um, I asked her, um, 
if she saw snow leopards very often and she she laughed and she said all the time they, they come right through my garden and I, I thought wow this woman's probably seen more snow leopards than than anyone on the planet <laughs> right in her front yard in her garden um so there was that amiable kind of love and respect as well and uh I will read something that I, I, I found interesting. Well, also with the shape shifting, I know I've, I've read all the stories about the uh, great Tibetan um, teacher, Milarepa, who himself was said to be a snow leopard, that he could shape shift into being a snow leopard. And another interesting fact that I thought was that a lot of um, the, the cats actually use uh, plants that they will eat plants like the females especially will eat this shrub that grows in the Himalaya called myocaria it's a kind of tamarisk plant and I think they're eating it to get nutrients and and uh, things that they need and it it also followed that a lot of the uh, Tibetan lamas also had knowledge of plant use and sometimes it's via watching an animal utilize a plant that they learn, you know. So I thought that there was a connection there. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in, I, there was this idea that uh, in the Dolpa region, there are stories of great lamas who frequently traveled into Tibet, assuming the form of snow leopards um, to gather rare, rare medicinal herbs. Um, and given the cat's knowledge of this tamarisk shrub and, and other mountain plants, it, it just felt like that's kind of an enfolded wisdom that the, the animals themselves carry. And it's quite interesting. But yeah, they're, they really are shapeshifters. And I have another piece that, um, this is from Rodney again. Um, I, I thought this was fascinating. If, if there is any doubt to the cat's abilities as a shapeshifter, consider the following two accounts. It gives it gives one pause. Rodney Jackson, director of the Snow Leopard Conservancy reports in his field notes, we solicited traditional stories about wildlife. My favorite came from one of the porters who described a trick used by snow leopards in hunting ibex. The cat gets above the herd and hides behind a large boulder. It then rolls an artemisia bush, a shrubby aromatic plant down the slope toward the ibex, which scatter and run away. When they realize it was just a bush, they come back to the grazing area. After a while, the snow leopard repeats the process. The ibex flee, but not far. Next, the cat makes itself into a ball and rolls down into the herd and makes its kill. It sounds like folklore, but I came across a similar reference in Helena Norbert Hodge's book, Ancient Futures, Learning from Ladakh. A shepherdess recounts the time. <clears throat> she had taken some sheep along a ravine, just above the path, a ball of birtse, a shrub that is also used as fuel, began rolling down the screed, not bouncing as you would expect, but gliding smoothly, even over bumpy stones. It surprised her. She had never seen anything like this before. Puzzled, she watched it roll closer. As it came to a standstill a few yards from the animals, it looked up at her, this shrub, and suddenly she realized what it was, a snow leopard. Now that is crazy, but <laughs> I thought those were amazing stories. And um, the snow leopard is capable of all kinds of things, I'll just say, yeah. Rodney, did you encounter lots of stories like that in your, during your study? Um, several, um, now I gotta think about them. There was the encounter between a snow leopard and an otter. And, you know, a lot of times I, the time to track snow leopards is in the winter when there's snow on the ground and you obviously see their pug marks more clearly. And uh, this one time along a stream, we saw um, pug marks of a snow leopard going to the edge of a stream. Uh, pug marks of an otter coming out of this water Oh. And the two, the two do meet uh, on a, a little level area, and there's a lot of thrashing about and going on, apparently, because they all mixed up with one another. And this is the story I was told, and um, I thought about it, and I said, oh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I wonder what's going on, because clearly snow leopards and otters 
uh, could not mate with one another, at least biologically, it wouldn't work. Um, you know, maybe in spiritually, they, they op occupy two realms, I don't know. But the more I thought about it, I realized that both of them love to roll in scent. And snow leopards uh, do a lot of face rubbing. They'll scent mark the rocks and they'll do a lot of cheek rubbing on that. And the idea is what they do in is transferring their scent back onto themselves, which is confirming their ownership of that uh, or their right to, uh, to hunt in that particular area. And whenever another cat comes along uh, and overmarks their scent, they will overmark that cat's scent so they can, you know, reassert themselves. And otters do much of the same thing with territoriality. Although otters are generally coming out of the water to go to the toilet. So it's actually a different <laughs> form of scent. <laughs> anyway, that's one I know. I'm trying to think of others. Dala would remember these much better than me. Um, yeah. What else? There, there is a Miller Raper one of him turning himself into a snow leopard and confounding people who were coming to feed him in the middle of winter because he was on retreat. Uh, there's also a case of a king from uh, Tibet flying into Dolpo and establishing himself or, you know, an important pilgrimage site of Crystal Mountain which is near where Peter Matheson and, and Shala went looking for snow leopards. And it's still a very sacred area, a mountain that local people will circumambulate. Uh, Dala, can you, I, I don't know if you on right now listening, can you think of other ones? That, yeah, it's, um, there's, there's some really amazing stories, but they're all way too long to tell, I think, in the time that we have left. Um, I think there's a section on our website that has some of the legends and stories. Rodney himself has the most amazing story of shape-shifting rocks in very close relationship to snow leopards. Um, but again, that's way too long to tell right now. So there's another book you can, got, you can get that has that story in it, which is also, I think, listed on our website. Well, in searching for the snow leopard, there is a, a long story that I won't read about a shape-shifting incident um, where a man's dreaming that something, uh, they're biting him and he wakes up and his leg is all bloody and a snow leopard, it was actually there, but he, it keeps changing shape from a horse to a lady to a snow leopard. It's quite amazing. But yeah. there is... It, also, what a lot of these photographers found is they, when in their essays in the book, is they weren't just observing a species. They found that they were um, forming a bond with an individual cat or a family. Oriel Alamani, um, whose cover appears or picture appears on the cover, um, he had the chance to go back several years in a row and he kept seeing the same family, the, a mother with her two cubs and they were growing up. And um, he remarked that he had never before, um, you know, he's, he's photographed all over the world, so many different species, but he had never before developed such a bond with specific animals. And he called them his beloved snow leopard, leopard family. And, uh, it's just beautiful. And he said, for the first time, I developed a bond with, with specific animals rather than just the species. And, but isn't that, Susan, you described that, that it was like, um, you know, you were having a, a, a communication with this one animal that you saw and not just observing a species. Of yeah. Members. Yeah. I think, well, for me, the individuality of any animal that, that I encounter is really important. And um, yeah, I uh, locally, I, I, I've I come to know certain uh, birds, eagles and owls and gotten to know individual animals and, and, and seals and different creatures. And it's, it's really profound when you develop that kind of bond and you know them and to whatever extent they seem to know you. And um, and also just realizing this, the individuality of, 
of every being is really amazing. I, I do have something I wanted to share if I can about um, sure. when, when Rodney was speaking about the otter story. Um, there's a great little uh, folk tale from Zanskar again that uh, <clears throat> this one, I'll just, it's not too long. A story from Zanskar <clears throat> tells of the snow leopard, otter, and domestic cat. The three are friends and share a common household. They decide to divide up their responsibilities. The snow leopard will gather firewood in the mountains. The cat will get fire from a village house and the otter will bring water from the river. The snow leopard while out gathering wood sees an ibex and immediately starts stalking it, forgetting about his task. Hunting soon becomes a way of life for him. The cat seeking fire finds life quite comfortable around the stove in, in the village home and decides to stay. The otter fetching water is soon enchanted by the river and its many fish to catch, and they all go their separate ways. Yet, it is said, the snow leopard never forgets his friends. Whenever he makes a kill, he shares choice bits of it with the cat and the otter. And um, I love that idea. And I remember too being in a village home in, in Ladakh and a little like ginger tomcat came around and I was just wondering, you know, have you seen snow leopards? <laughs> have they shared a little bit of their food with you? Um, I like the folk tales because they do seem to knit together a sense of community um, of the other animals and how they interact. And um, I mean, it's folk tale, but it's also, kind of recognizing a kind of a heart and a soul to the all the dimensions of, of shared lives and uh, they're just wonderful but yeah I really liked hearing um, Rodney's story there about the otter and the tracks. That was great. Yeah, Atlanta Snow Leopard Network um, is uh, has been Darla's um, project for several years now and they're expanding and expanding and um, their main uh, thrust is using implementing the stories and the spiritual and cultural aspect of the snow leopard the importance to the people that live there to save it to do the conservation to make it important to them um, not just you know, your religion says, you know, don't, don't harm animals, but more it's part of your actual culture and they're so important and, and, you know, using ecotourism and, and sharing, you know, the Himalayan homestays where people get to experience the culture of that area and actually stay in people's homes, like in a, a bed and breakfast type of a situation and, and learn about the culture, but using that culturally spiritual significance of the snow leopard to preserve it or to conserve it um, uh, in addition to the you know predator proofing and nighttime light deterrence and solar fencing and things but using that combining your western science you know the ecological importance of the snow leopard as the apex predator um, as a keystone species, you know, maintaining balance to the ecosystem, combining the, that with its cultural and spiritual importance. And that's really the focus of the book, Searching for the Snow Leopard, was to emphasize that, that cultural and spiritual experience and the bond and, and to bring that together with biological, you know, ecological science in order to, um, preserve this animal and, and not let it disappear into extinction. But did, Susan, did you have anything that you would um, like to share with us? Our time is about up and we so appreciate you joining us today. And I really, from the bottom of my heart, wanna thank you for being a contributor to the book. Um, it was- well, It was an honor to contribute, um, especially alongside all the <clears throat> wonderful photographers and and wildlife conservation researchers uh, it's it's wonderful work and uh, and it's a beautiful book and i want to thank you uh siobhan for spearheading the whole project um, it was it was just a, it was it, i had no idea what i was getting into but it's one of the best yeah. things i've ever done in my life and absolutely unfortunately i am the only contributor to the book 
who has not seen a snow leopard in the wild. <laughs> I'm the only one. Um, so, but yeah. uh, it was my honor to do it and, it. and it was such an honor to work with everyone, you know, that contributed to the book. It's just, it was a marvelous experience. It was, it is the neatest thing I've ever done in my life. And, you know. oh, it's a wonderful, beautiful book. And, um, and uh, it really felt like an act of community too among various people. And, uh, and it all goes in support of the conservation and um, the ongoing work. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, well, I don't have much more to say except thank you for inviting me to this. And, uh, and I hope that people who don't have the book will seek it out. Um, and, uh, and the Snow Leopard Conservancy website has just wonderful information too for further stuff on, on this cat. And uh, yeah, may they live long, wild and free. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Well, thank it's you. been such an honor talking with you today. I, this is so neat. This is the first time that Susan and I have actually met via the internet. So. <laughs> All of our correspondence and yeah. electronic, but uh, it's it's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank all of you for attending. And I did record this, so hopefully I'll be able to get it up there on our website in case someone missed it and share the link on Facebook. I do apologize for my failure to be able to share it to the Snow Leopard Conservancy page as a Facebook Live, Ashley is going to have to teach me how to do that. Um, Ashley, did you want to say hi? Ashley Lutz Nelson, our vice president is also with us. She joined it, joined us a little bit ago and you wanna say hi to everyone before we ah, start? Hi everyone, thanks for joining today. Hi Susan, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you for sharing your experiences and I'm just thrilled about this book and all the stories in it. It's been very inspiring to read. Um, so congratulations and um, yeah, thanks again for joining us today. Thanks, Ashley. And Varpu, I love your snow leopard. She's got a, everybody can see Varpu, she's got a snow leopard on each shoulder. <laughs> so, well, everyone, thank you so much. Our next cat chat will be in a couple weeks. And we will be speaking with Margaret Chi. She is the lady who came up with this whole idea to do a book. Only we didn't know what kind of a book it was going to be just about snow leopards. And she's in Australia and she's our literary agent. And so she'll be joining us in a couple weeks. And I hope all of you can come back and join us then. And if you have any more questions, be sure to leave them um, on our Facebook page. And Susan and I, or Ashley or Darla or Rodney can answer them for you and uh, check out the website and we'll be seeing you. Thank you, Susan. You're Thank welcome. you. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a great day. You too.